Hey guys, welcome back to Medical Coding with Blue. It is Q&A Tuesday. I have plenty of good questions, so let's go ahead and get started. Number one, what did I mean when by saying that depending on where in the U.S. you are, you can make a different amount of money starting as a medical coder? So what I mean by this is like geographically, like California is like more expensive to live in, right? It is like one of the most expensive states to live in versus like Arkansas, which has, um, it's not as expensive to live there. So what I mean is like different areas is gonna start their coders at different amounts of money. Now, I am not going to say a dollar amount, okay? Because we've talked about this before. I don't like saying how much coders make because like I said, every state is a different amount that they start their coders out at. There's a myriad of factors that go into it. Cost of living is number one. Um, if there's if it is a specialty that you are working with, that's another thing. Uh, if it is a public facility, or if it is a government-owned facility, if it is a private hospital, that kind of thing, all of those things factor into it. When I started in my hometown, literally, I went to one place. And they started their coders out at one price. And again, I am not going to give specific amounts of money, but that one facility started out their, their coders at one price. I went literally down the street to another facility and they had their coders start $5 more per hour. I went down the street further. They started their coders out $3 less than the $5 one that went up. So Again, it's it's all going to depend where you are, what specialty, public or private facility. Is this a teaching hospital? Is this a government-owned hospital? Those are all the kind of factors that go into it. So, again, if you live like in Alaska, those it's it's a higher cost of living up in Alaska versus uh, something like uh, Michigan or Texas or uh, Florida or New York. You know, New York is very expensive as well. So you know, those things are going to be factored into what they're starting their coders out at. So that is what I meant by that. Now, you can go to like a job analysis. Um, they have a lot of those online uh, where they give like salary, uh, salary ranges for medical coders or any profession that you may be looking into. So again, go through those because I refuse to say a dollar amount when it comes to being a medical coder because it is different everywhere and I don't ever want to have somebody think oh well she said it's this much and and that's what I'm gonna be expecting I don't ever want to put anybody in that position this is why I always recommend that you guys do your research and research 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 and I, I say this all the time because it, it's ultimately your life it's ultimately what you are gonna spend 40 hours a week doing if you want to be a medical coder, if you want to to be in this in this industry in this field, it's all going to take research. You're you're going to eventually have to do research as a medical coder anyway, so may as well start early. Okay. So next question is, how are medical coders identified when looking for jobs? Like, what other titles do they have? So I've seen job listings uh, for medical coders as medical coders or outpatient coder, inpatient coder, level one coder, level two, level three coder. Um, in different facilities, level one, level two, level three coders are, are meaning different things um, because sometimes level one coders in certain facilities mean uh, that they only code for inpatient. And then sometimes in another facility, a level one coder may be like an ER coder. So it just depends on where you are. Unfortunately, I, I, I know I don't want to give out answers that are like, oh, maybe this, maybe that. But uh, that is sort of, you know, it just depends on the facility and, and what they deem to be level one, level two, level three. So, yes, that is, you know, that is what they are called. So medical coder, yes outpatient coder, inpatient coder, ER coder. So I've seen them all listed that way. Okay. So next question is, when is a good time to join AHIMA as a student and what are the benefits? 
So if you are in an AHIMA approved program, congratulations. Uh, by all means, go ahead and join as a student. Uh, student membership is a lot cheaper than a regular. Once you have your credential and you are in the door, it's going to be higher. Um, as a member, you are entitled to a, a discount when you are um, purchasing anything from the site. Uh, and it'll tell you like what the student rate is and you know what non-member rates are and things like that, or member rates um, as well. If you are a student, and you are going to conference, that is a nice little discount as well. So <laughs> that's another benefit of having a student membership with AHIMA. So something to consider. But yes, those are some of the benefits. And besides, you get full access to the website. You get full access to um, like their job bank and as well as like the local chapter meetings, you know, so you can attend those and reach out and, and network with other coders because when you are a student and you're starting out, networking and shaking hands and meeting lots of people is a very good thing because you never know where that um, potential job connection might be because again, it's all about who you know. And for me, like I said, when I started, it was because my principal knew somebody that was had a temporary agency that specialized in medical. And that was how I ended up getting my first job, um, which was a temporary job, you know, as a medical coder. So it's all about those connections. All right. So next question is, can males be medical coders? Yes, uh, I have said this many times. There are not enough males in medical coding. It is a primarily woman dominated field. Um, I don't know why, uh, but I mean, that's just, it's just the way it is. Uh, there's so many women, but there are males. Um, there may not be a lot at a facility that you work at, um, so <laughs> I'm just saying. But um, it's, yes, we, we welcome everybody. Uh, I did have an embarrassing incident that happened <laughs> in, um, in, in Chicago when I was there because they had a simultaneous um, conference going on for the uh, uh, oncologist, ra uh, radiology oncologist, and they were having their big conference at the same time and I jumped on their shuttle thinking that it was the shuttle to go uh, for the AHIMA conference and I just jumped in there and I was like oh hello you know seeing all these men there was a bunch of guys I was like wow I've never seen so many male coders in one sitting and then hello <laughs> they actually turned out to be radio radio radiology you know oncologists you know and so it's just like oops <laughs> just kidding so I mean that was that was my embarrassing thing. But anyway, uh, but yes, if you are a male, uh, we, we welcome everybody. I mean, everybody is welcome, you know. Uh, extroverted people, introverted people, you know, we welcome anybody and everybody because it takes a village and it takes all types to be a medical coder, okay? Um, there are some uh, traits that, that, are, that will lead you to be a successful coder, like attention to detail. Um, good communication skills and even if you you are a shy person or maybe you're an introverted person um, it doesn't mean that you can't be a good medical coder um, a lot of what we do is work independently that is something that I like to do uh, I like working independently I like that I don't have to um, constantly like have my supervisor over my shoulder either I can do you know my assignments and things like that so um, for me, it's 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 really good, and I used to be really shy in the beginning when I when I first started, and I've talked about my my experiences with you know developing my relationships with my providers and and speaking about Doctor X and things like that. Doctor X is uh, one of my most favorite, if not the favorite provider that I have because uh, because of him I've learned a lot about communicating with providers. Um, he was the one who was very instrumental in, uh, in getting me to open up and start talking because I, in the beginning, I thought, oh, you know, these doctors, I mean, they all went to medical school. They don't want, they don't want to, to know anything that I have to say, but that wasn't the case. You know, they, they want to know what we know and they want to know, you know, what can they do to get better? 
And so because of him, you know, I am more, more open with providers because I don't have that mindset anymore. So um, sometimes you, you do start off a little shy in the beginning, but once you start um, gaining experience and getting more, um, getting more confident with your knowledge, the more um, outgoing you'll you'll be, uh, and even if you are, like I say, if you are an introvert, that's okay. We welcome all types. So, uh, if you're thinking about it, uh, do your research and see if it's right for you. You know, um, I will be honest. Medical coding is not right for everybody. Uh, some people get into it and don't realize that it's a lot of reading, <laughs> and it's constant learning. You know, I am. 10 plus years in, I say this all the time, I'm 10 plus years in and I'm still learning. So I learn something new every day, you know, uh, but it's, it's, it's something that I enjoy. I like learning. I like reading. I like studying, you know, I don't mind any of that. So, um, I just think it makes, uh, it makes me more sharper as a coder. It makes me, um, just, just better all around as far as like my craft and, and knowing what I'm doing. Um, I also say, another thing I say a lot too is, you know, these, these doctors, they went to medical school. You know, they, they went through years of schooling. And um, as their coder, the way I look at it is, it's my job to be as educated as I possibly can because I didn't go to medical school, you know? So I have to, I have to kind of catch up and, and, and learn and, and find out and ask questions and, and try to know what is going on and make sure that I understand because the better that you understand, the easier that book gets, you know, whether you're looking through the diagnosis book or the procedures book or, you know, the Hicks picks book, the more you understand the disease process and the body, the better off you'll be. So, uh, that's my thought about that. And is the RHIT, um, the same thing as a medical coder. No, it's actually not. Um, the RHIT is the associate's degree, essentially. Um, registered health information technician. Uh, it's, it's the associate's degree um, for, for uh, registered health information technician, yes. <laughs> so it is our version of the associate's degree. And they uh, are more of like the manager side of the house. Uh, they do a lot of auditing and things like that. They do a lot of supervisory roles and things. Um, those are more for like those types of positions, you know. Um, sometimes if you have your RHIT, sometimes when you go to apply, um, Certain facilities won't care. They'll be like, oh, okay, you have RHIT, you're good to go. Uh, some facilities will want you to ha to carry another um, credential after your name, like a CCS or CCSP. Um, so, and these are HEMA credentials I'm, I'm referring to. Um, so with CCS or CCSP, it just sort of tells them as well uh, that you specifically know like about outpatient or you specifically know about both outpatient and inpatient. So it just, it's more of an alphabet after your name. So that's just uh, something to consider. But uh, RHIT is really good to have. So, you know, again, you know, if you have that, that's wonderful, you know. Uh, but like I said, not every facility is gonna care if you have a uh, another credential, you know. So just something to think about. Um, are there plenty of jobs uh, or is there plenty of work from home um, opportunities? So when you start out as a medical coder, and there's a lot of people that want to get into it because they want to work at home. Okay. This is a perk uh, as far as like working at home. Um, I'm going to sneeze. I'm trying not to sneeze. I hate sneezing. <sighs> but I feel like I'm trying to get hay fever again. <laughs> it's this weather change. It's starting to get a little cooler, which is fine with me, but it's wreaking havoc on my allergies. Um, back to what I was saying, are there plenty of work from home opportunities? So when you are starting out as a medical coder, I have never seen, okay, it does not mean it's not out there, okay, but I'm just telling you, that I have never seen a remote coding company 
allow brand new coders with zero experience to work for their company. I've never seen that. Doesn't mean that it's not possible, but I'm just saying that I've never personally seen it. Um, and when you are starting out in the very beginning as a brand new coder, do you really want to be at home where you can't really ask questions? Because a lot of uh, working at home, you know, you're doing things remotely, either you're using Messenger or, you know, you're, you're doing uh, video conferencing and things like that. Um, it's good to be around other coders, especially in the beginning, so that you can ask questions. Um, you can start working from home later on. You know, you can start looking uh, once you've had more experience and, and more time and get more comfortable being a coder, um, that you can work at home. Now, sometimes people think, oh, it's so great to work at home. You know, you don't have to, you don't have to rush into traffic and you could just wear whatever you want to. But uh, sometimes when you work at home, it's a lot more, uh, there's a lot more um, higher production required. Uh, production is, is one of those things that, you know, when you're at home, it's easy to get distracted. Oh, yeah, I'll just go throw, it a lot, throw a load of laundry in or I'll just go flip on the TV or I'll go make a cup of coffee. And by the time you know it, your morning is gone and you haven't done anything, right? Or um, like, you know, you're at home and, you know, you're on the phone or whatever, which being on the phone dr makes me crazy when I see people on the phone when they're supposed to be working. It literally makes me crazy. Like if you're on a break, that's okay, you know, but I've seen people literally be on the phone while they're trying to work. And I, I it, it bothers me because I think you can't really fully be engaged with what you're doing if you're being distracted on the phone. Okay. Um, but yes, that's, that's just one of those things. And sometimes like when you, um, I've heard coders say that when they worked at home, they hated it because they were lonely, you know, um, you, you don't get to dress up, you know, you don't get to, to go to your workplace and, and see your coworkers and things like that. And <laughs> there's two sides of the coin on that one, right? So, uh, a few years ago. Uh, before I moved into this new facility that I'm I'm in now, um, I worked in a tin can. I called it the tin can, okay? It was a little box room, you know, and there was 20 of us in this tiny box, and I hated it. I hated it so bad because I, I worked on an island, okay, which was fine, okay? I was okay with working on an island by myself. Um, so we had cubicles and bullpens. <laughs> and I'm sorry for some of you that have already heard this one, but, uh, so I'm in this room and, and there's 20 women. And so like, imagine 20 women, you know, and okay. And I will say this, this is a little tiny disclaimer. It wasn't all bad. Okay. It was not all bad. We had some pretty good times together, but sometimes you just want to work and you want to get your stuff done and you want to just concentrate on what you're doing. And you can't do that if you have people that are coming by shaking your chair or pulling your hair, which I always had constantly. Oh, hey, how you doing? How you doing? I'm like, can can y'all, can you not touch me? I mean, <laughs> you know, and so it's, it's like, it's like being in a room full of your sisters, you know, and it's just like, it was just so much after a while. And so, you know, when I was finally able to move into this new facility, I was so happy because you know having my own space now now I have my own space and having that ability to be able to close the door is wonderful but I like seeing the people that I work with I mean I I like you know um uh seeing them every day and it's not just the other coders I'm not talking about them I'm talking about like my providers and you know um, the ancillary staff and Everybody that makes the hospital run, I like seeing them every day. Now, if I was still stuck in that tiny box room, then I would probably want to work from home because we didn't have a lot of exposure to our providers back then. Um, so I didn't, I didn't really have that relationship yet. Uh, most of my time was spent with all of these other women and, you know, <laughs> it's hard working in a room full of women, you know, and so I wouldn't have minded being at home at that time because like I said, if if one woman in this tiny room had a bad day, oh, everybody had a bad day, you know, and so it was just like, <sighs> you know, it, it was a lot, you know, um, 
but it does get lonely if you're if you're at home, you know. Um, but like I said, if you're in a situation like that, then maybe it, it would be good to be at home. But uh, you know, it, it gets lonely, and to me, I you know I like dressing up. Um, I like you know putting on makeup, and and I like you know going to my workplace, and I like you know having work at work, and then coming home and being at home in my sanctuary in my free space you know where there's nothing I can leave work at the door and I can just come in and I can um, talk with you guys of course uh, and just do whatever or you know sink into my couch and just you know watch TV and just do whatever or zone out and not have to worry about anything you know uh, working from home would also require uh, you to have a private space uh, because you can't uh, you're, you're dealing with people's personal information this is HIPAA and you know you don't want to be violating any of that um, information you know by just leaving your computer out willy-nilly you know you have to have a secure area uh, you also have to have a secure internet connection you know um, you can't just be trying to connect off a of Wi-Fi, you know, at your local place or whatever, um, you have to have a very secure line because, again, you're dealing with people's personal information. So there's a lot to working at home. Um, it's not just all fun and games, you know, even though it may sound like it is, but, you know, there's a lot of things that go into it. So um, just something to keep in mind. Uh, I know that sometimes, like, for certain, like, working parents – um, they would love to do that. But again, you have to be able to concentrate on your job, you know, because even when you're working from home, you know, and, and if you're working nine to five, you know, that's dedicated work time. It's not, oh, let me go run over here and, you know, start laundry and do all this other stuff. You know, it is literally work time. So uh, if you're disciplined enough, if you've got a good location, if you've got a secure area, then, you know. Maybe, you know, maybe that would be good for you. So, um, but like I said, if you, if you're just brand new and starting out, um, it, it may take a while to find a job working from home, especially because they're going to want you to have experience before they just let you loose and work at home. Okay. So that's my answer on that one. Um, is medical coding going away anytime soon? Absolutely not. Um, I have heard that for 10 years, <laughs> over 10 years since I started uh, medical coding school. They said, oh yeah, they're just going to, you know, do away with you guys and it's all going to be all digital and everything. No, you still have to have somebody that's looking at the documentation. You still have to have that human element. Yes, there's going to be threats to our profession. There's going to be artificial intelligence. Um, but again, you still have to have a person who's looking at the documentation because like um, back, the word back can mean like, you know, hey, she's coming back for her third appointment or he hurt his back, you know, lifting a box, you know. So there's things, there's there's programs and things like that, like natural word, pro natural language processing um, those kinds of things, but they still have to have a human element. Uh, they still have to have a human looking at and understanding the documentation because, as I've said, you know, these computer programs are only as smart as you're telling them to be, you know. Um, so there's there's a lot of things in that. Um, and then sometimes there's that threat of, oh, they're going to be sending it all overseas and, you know, you, we're not going to need you guys. And this is, this is um, there are certain facilities that I know um, that refuse to send their stuff overseas. Now, I will say this. This is another little disclaimer. Um, I'm not saying that all of it is wrong when it's sent overseas, but I will say this. Um, when you have a language barrier, I have seen and heard of stories where they have confused words. And so when they confuse words, then, you know, the stuff is not coded correctly. It still has to come back to a U.S.-based coder who can understand and read it, and then they have to correct it. So if you're, if they're paying for something to be done cheaply, and then they have to pay to have it redone again, there's really no point in in trying to save a few bucks, especially if it's not being done correctly. Um, and I'm just saying that sometimes when there's a language barrier, 
that that's something that that you know does happen um again not saying that all of it is wrong but i'm just saying that um i've heard stories and they're they're pretty bad you know that you know they they sort of mess it up you know they mess up what they're reading um or they misinterpret what they're reading you know so again you know uh, it's it's one of those things that they they've been talking about it they think they could do it and they can't uh, because a lot of times they like i said they'll they'll go and they'll look at it and they'll say, well, we're just paying to have it redone. It's it's too much money. It's costing us too much money because it looks good on paper. But then when they add up the cost of having to have corrections and have somebody else look at it, it's not worth it. So, uh, again, don't let anybody scare you into saying, oh, yeah, it's going to go away. They've been saying that for over 10 years. So I'm not worried. I'm not. I mean, personally, I'm not worried. No. Um, because we're always going to have health care, right? We're always going to have doctors, we're always going to have facilities, and we're always going to have to have this information, whether it is for statistical purposes or for insurance purposes or for anything, you know, study, research, or whatever. You know, so, Nick, again, <laughs> I'm not worried. That's my thought on that one. So, um, and one other thing, <laughs> the last thing, because I'm just getting long-winded on <laughs> <laughs> on these episodes lately uh you know people have asked you know where can they find resources for medical coding go to the library go to the library i have said this the library is free and so is like the internet but the internet is the internet okay take time with some physical books uh go to the library go check out the section about about uh medicine and the body and things like that and it doesn't necessarily have to be a uh, a medical coding book. It can just be a particular book, like about pathophysiology, or you know, uh, something about the body or uh, anatomy or something else. You know, it could be anything that you think would benefit um, you to learn more about your field. You know, about your 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 whatever clinic that you're working in, you know, uh, for me, I like orthopedics, everybody knows this, <laughs> orthopedics and podiatry, I love it, uh, I love those two, those are my favorites, neurology and pulmonology are also my favorites, rheumatology is, is, is eking up there, because rheumatology is very interesting, because it's very involved, and there's so much more detail in, in that clinic, that particular clinic, that it's just like, wow, so, um, but yeah, there's, there's just a, a lot to those things. Uh, but yes, take the time, go to the library, you know, uh, see, see what they have, you know, again, the library is free and I am all about learning stuff for free, you know, cause why spend money if you don't need to? That's just my thoughts on that one. So, uh, I hope you all have enjoyed <laughs> this episode of Q&A Tuesday. Uh, tomorrow's episode, I'm going to be, st I'm still working on it, um, but there will be Quiz Friday. So I am going to be doing some more, um, uh, what is it? Procedure coding. Uh, and this time I'm going to concentrate on urology because, and I said urology, uh, because uh, I did get a new urology book when I was at conference. I'm so excited. So um, anyway, if you are interested in knowing which book I'm talking about, check out my Instagram, Medical Coding with Blue. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up, but uh, I hope you all had a great day, and I will see you all tomorrow. So if you are a medical coder, a medical coding student, somebody curious about the fascinating world of medical coding, a provider or a nurse, I invite you to like and subscribe and follow me on my journey in medical coding. All right, I will see you all tomorrow. Bye!